we'll continue our discussion on uh, gradient descent method today. And the idea is I have xk plus 1 equals xk plus alpha k dk. And in the case of gradient descent, we take dk to be minus a positive definite matrix multiplied by the gradient of the function at xk. Okay? And so what's happening pictorially, somebody asked me this question and I think it's a very nice thing to know what is happening if you multiply this matrix dk, dk is positive definite. So you are standing here, this is your xk, this is your gradient of fxk, this is fx equal to 1, fx equal to 0, and this is your x star. This is the optimal point. Uh, I don't want to say optimal point because typically gradient descent would converge to a stationary point and a point is a stationary point if the gradient vanishes at that point. Okay? So let's say x star is where we want to converge. This is my negative of gradient of fxk. This is the positive, this is gradient of fxk and this is negative of gradient of fxk. And we multiply it by this matrix dk which is positive definite. So what do you think would happen to this negative of gradient? What happens when you multiply a vector and this is the vector by a positive definite matrix? Any thoughts? What happens when you multiply a matrix to a vector? What happens to the vector? The vector will be rotated and scaled, right? But this is not just any matrix. This is a positive definite matrix, so the rotation is going to be less than 90 degrees. Okay, that's the that's the point of having a positive definite matrix. So you could get minus dk gradient of fxk in this way, or you could get minus dk gradient of fxk. By picking an appropriate value of dk, you could either go in that direction or you could go in this direction, right? Now, which direction is better? Should we go in this direction or should we go in this direction? Okay, this one. This is the one where you want to go. So therefore, the choice of an appropriate dk is very important in order to improve the rate of convergence or in order to converse to the x star as soon as possible. And that's why we talked about Newton's method where dk was taken to be the second derivative inverse which has this property that it rotates this vector, the negative of gradient, towards the point x star. Okay? And as long as you take smaller steps and then again find what the gradient is and then multiplied by a positive definite matrix, you will get this. Uh, so this would be minus dk plus 1 gradient of fxk plus 1. This would be xk plus 1. This is gradient of minus gradient of fxk plus 1. Right? So you keep doing this process and then eventually you will converge to x star pretty quickly. On the other hand, if you use descent, you will go along this direction, maybe you will stop here because of your alpha k, and then again you will try to go here, and then here, so and then. You were drawing it on the gradient line, not the one that was multiplied by dk. Yeah, so this one is on the gradient line, okay? So this is what I'm showing, th so this particular, well, I want to show it in a different color. Uh, so this is what a gradient descent, like steepest descent would look like. This is the steepest descent and this is the
steepest descent and this would be Newton's method. Okay. So, the number of steps you have to take in Newton's method is much lower than the number of steps you need to take while steepest descent. You have a question? Oh, no. Sorry. No? Okay. Okay, so rotating the, the direction, so this one rotates the gradient of f in a fashion that you get closer to x star as soon as you can. Now, what are the theoretical properties of gradient descent? What can we say about this method in general for any non-convex function? Okay, so in order to introduce or in order to uh, understand what the theoretical property of this uh, gradient descent method is, I need to introduce a definition So we say that dk k in n is gradient related to xk We say that dk is gradient related to xk if xk converges to x bar and x bar is non stationary then limpsup over k going to infinity gradient of fxk transpose dk is less than 0. Okay, so let's see what happens when you pick dk to be this particular value. So xk converges to x bar and x bar non stationary, non stationary implies gradient of fxk is not equal to 0 for all k much much greater than 0. So, as long as k is sufficiently large, we know that the, the gradient of fxk will be non-zero and I have dk equals minus dk gradient of fxk. So, what is gradient of fxk transpose d dk equals minus okay this is positive definite okay and we have the same vector on the left and right so this is strictly negative for all k sufficiently large.
okay so the gradient descent algorithm does satisfy the gradient relatedness condition as long as this dk is not vanishing okay so you could have a positive definite matrix that could eventually go to zero as k goes to infinity but we want the eigenvalues of dk to be within some positive interval within some interval so that we know that dk should not converge to zero as k goes to infinity in which case the limb soup will always be strictly less than zero okay does that make sense okay so all i'm showing here is that this algorithm that we studied we introduced in the class last time it satisfies this property of being gradient related to xk as long as the eigenvalues of dk are strictly positive for all k okay and it's not going to zero as k goes to infinity so we want of course the eigenvalues of dk to be bounded but boundedness is not sufficient because even zero is a bounded number you want it to be away from zero as k goes to infinity yeah, yeah. so what does gradient related actually mean for us in terms of optimization algorithms what does that property give us what does that property give us uh it gives us so let's let's see what this gives us so i have f of xk plus 1 equals f of xk plus alpha gradient of xk transpose dk alpha k plus small o of alpha k square no small o of alpha k okay so this term is ignored because alpha k is small this term is negative because of this reason gradient relatedness condition so what this is saying is fxk plus 1 is strictly less than f of xk so you are always descending that's what the gradient relatedness means okay so as long as you are converging to a non stationary point no you are not converging if you are going towards a non stationary point you will always be descending when you reach the stationary point then you don't have anywhere to go because the gradient vanishes the gradient of f vanishes at a stationary point and then dk is equal to 0 so you're not essentially moving anywhere okay but as we know stationary point means nothing in optimization it's just a candidate for an optimal solution it may not be optimal solution but that's what we can get to using the gradient descent method now of course if your function is convex then you have a lot more structure in your problem and gradient descent will always converge to the optimal point okay so the theorem is or the main theoretical result here is uh dk gradient related to xk okay and alpha k is chosen according to minimization rule limited minimization rule or armijo's rule so we make these two assumptions okay so we need to pick dk and we need to pick alpha k right so dk is gradient so we pick we come up with an algorithm for choosing dk okay such that dk is gradient related to xk what does that mean this eigen values of dk should not go to zero as k goes to infinity okay so as long as dk is gradient related to xk and alpha k is chosen according to minimization rule limited minimization rule or armijo's rule then if xk converges to x bar then x bar is stationary okay what does stationary means it means that gradient of f at x bar will be equal to 
Yes. So uh, with uh, graded related bit, we said uh, x bar is non-stationary. Mm -hmm. And with the theorem, we're saying <coughs> x bar is stationary. Yes, it's that's the result of the theorem. Here it's the assumption. It's the hypothesis. If x k, if you pick a sequence that's going to a non-stationary point, that's the hypothesis, then this should hold true, okay. right? And this is the definition of being gradient related to x k, okay? Here, it's the conclusion that x bar is stationary. If, you, if your algorithm converges to a point, so first thing is your algorithm may not converge to a point, okay, for whatever reason. There could be errors, there could be something happening weird within the algorithm, and it's not converging, okay? But if it converges, you're guaranteed to be at a stationary point. So the gradient related theorem is... It's not a theorem, it's a well, definition. The definition is telling us that if we have that property, we're not going to get stuck anywhere that's non-stationary for right. peculiar reasons. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's what it is. And this assumes nothing about f except the potentialities? Nothing else, yeah. In fact, uh, if you, if you look at the theorem closely, it doesn't really require f to be twice differentiable. So your dk need not be the second derivative of f inverse. It could be identity. It could be any other positive definite matrix. All you need to ensure is that it has to be gradient related. Okay. When dk is identity, all the eigenvalues are equal to 1. It's not changing with respect to k. It's bounded away from zero. It's bounded from uh, from the. Uh, it's also bounded from above because the eigenvalues are not going to infinity. So everything works perfectly nicely for steepest descent. And if your steepest descent algorithm converges, you are guaranteed to converge to a stationary point of the original function. Any question? Okay, isn't that cool? Uh, so this is, now, why is this cool? Because, uh, I don't know, I, I cannot put a percentage, but maybe 50% of the algorithms in the world, optimization algorithms in the world, uh, uses gradient descent, steepest descent, okay? And this, this theorem says that, well, steepest descent, if it converges, you are at a stationary point. Okay, or you are close to a station. Well, of course, you don't go all the way to infinity because nobody has infinite time in, in, in the life. But So you stop somewhere close to uh, x bar, and so you are near stationary and near, well, hopefully near optimal, uh, depending upon whether your function is convex or not, or what the second derivative property of the function is at the point where you stop your iterations. Okay. The other thing I wanted to mention was about the speed of Newton's method. Okay. Now there is quite a bit of mumbo jumbo in the book which says if assumption one, two, three, four, five, six holds, then this is the result you get. Okay. So it will hold in most benign situations. Most of the optimization problems this would hold unless you are looking at a really pathological optimization problem. So in Newton's method, your xk plus 1 minus x star is going to be less than or equal to xk minus x star square for k large. Okay? So if this is, let's say you are uh, 0 0.5 away from uh, x star, then this will be of the order of 0 0.25. And if this is 0 0.25, then xk plus 2 minus x star uh, will be Of course, there is a less than equal to sign, so it could be much smaller than 0 0.25, but this is just an upper bound. So xk plus 2 minus x star will be less than equal to 0 0.0625. So as you can see how quickly it converges 
to the optimal point. So that's the benefit of Newton's method. This is known as superlinear convergence. Okay, uh, so 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 that's what basically the book. If you go through the so there are certain hypotheses given in the book. Of course, those hypotheses needs to be satisfied. But the result, the end result is Newton's method is has superlinear convergence property. What does superlinear convergence property says? Well, your x k plus one minus x star. So how close you are to the optimal point at the next iterate is square is of the order of square of uh, the previous the distance with the previous iterate when k is sufficiently large. Okay, so typically when you run an optimization problem you start from very far off from the optimal point and you take small steps to get closer to the optimal point and then suddenly things converge pretty quickly so does that depend on which normal you like it obviously has to be fixed across the inequality but is that like it's I think the book uses two norm okay. yeah um, but i wouldn't be surprised if it holds for pretty much all norms in RN. Any other question? Okay. So we talked about two things. The first thing was that under certain conditions, your gradient descent algorithm will converge to a stationary point. And in the case of Newton's method, it will converge very fast to the stationary point. Okay. Those were the two messages until now. Uh, let's look at another way of understanding how these algorithms are designed. Okay, so how would you think about this algorithm, or how would you come up with this class of algorithms of gradient descent? using another approach. Of course, we, we, we talked about one approach, which is using Taylor series and all that. Uh, there's another approach, so let's, uh, let's discuss that particular approach. So I'm going to use Taylor series to get a function g of xk, or not, g of x or rather gk of x as gradient of fxk no fxk plus i actually want to write xk plus d plus d transpose gradient of fxk Okay, so this is a linear approximation of the function around xk. Linear approximation or first order, order approximation. Okay. So I have a function this is my x, this is my f of x and I have a function that looks like this, okay? And I'm at a point, this is my xk, and I have to do a linear interpolation, not linear interpolation, linear approximation of the function around this point. So that would be something like this. Okay, so that's my g of xk plus d.
now instead of trying to minimize the original function what I want to do is minimize this function by picking an appropriate D okay so you told me that I want to minimize this function and what I'm telling you is look we don't know how this function looks like all over the place so wherever you are standing right now just look at it locally okay and wherever you see a uh, and and just look at it locally do the first order approximation and then t go into a direction that's going to reduce this function okay just take a small step in that direction so what's the direction d that you should take in order to minimize this function okay sorry the left <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, can someone give me a more mathematical answer instead of left and right yes is it going to be the uh, uh, negative arrow negative gradient of fxk if I go in this direction then I know that g of xk plus d is going to be less than f of xk right so and what is this method this is the steepest descent method right so in steepest descent okay so imagine yourself you're standing at some point in a mountain range and you need to get to the valley and you look at it locally you figure out where the descent is maximum so where if you take one step you're going to actually uh, reduce your height at a maximum by, by a maximum amount and then you take a step in that particular direction okay you have you can look at all all 360 degrees all the sides and then you pick a step in a direction which uh, minimizes your height at the next step okay so that's what you are doing so that's steepest descent now you can say that wow if I can take first order approximation and I can uh, come up with a descent direction why not take the second order approximation and come up with another descent direction okay so let's do that Okay, so what's the second order approximation? G of xk plus d equals f of xk plus the gradient plus d transpose fxk d. Okay. So this is the second order approximation. Now here we solve this problem by inspection. So what's the optimal D? Well just take the negative of this vector. That's the optimal D. Now here it's a convex problem. So we need to do a little bit more work to find an optimal D. Is that D transpose times the gradient or the gradient transpose times D? Or does it matter? It doesn't matter. Because v1 transpose v2 is the same as v2 transpose v1 because it's a scalar quantity okay so now we need to do a little bit more work to figure out where exactly is this what is the d at which this is minimized so i want to find d star which is arc min of g of xk plus d d n rn and I can take the first derivative with respect to d okay and what is this equal to it's a gradient of fxk plus the second derivative multiplied by t star
okay and this would imply that my d star is second derivative inverse the first derivative oh and there is a negative sign Okay, and this is your Newton's method. Yes. It's a matrix. It's a matrix. Yes. It's a square matrix. The, the direction we want is the opposite of a, the inverse of a matrix times a vector. Times a vector, yes. I mean, I'm assuming that, you know, you um, a vector is also a matrix, but let's say that a vector is a vector and a matrix it has at least another dimension. Okay, it cannot be a single dimensional matrix. So what I'm suggesting here is this is matrix inverse, a square matrix inverse, time the the vector, the gradient. How did we go from the argument g x k plus d to the uh, the first derivative? Okay, that's yeah. Yeah. So this is so if you want to minimize a convex, this is a convex function assuming the second derivative is positive definite, mm -hmm. a positive semi-definite. And then the first derivative is optimal, uh, is sufficient. Okay. Of course, throughout the uh, throughout our discussion, we will always assume that your second derivative is positive semi-definite, uh, because if it is not, then it's highly likely that you are at a saddle point, and you have to use some method to escape the saddle point. Okay. So this is the Newton's method. So now you will have another idea. Okay. The new idea is, look, we use the first order approximation. We got an algorithm. We use the second order approximation. We got an algorithm. Why not use a third order approximation and get another algorithm? Okay. But there is a problem with the third order algorithm, which is you don't have a matrix anymore, you have a three-dimensional matrix or a tensor, okay? And that's very hard to work with. Uh, and I, I haven't seen any paper that is using the third order approximation to solve this problem, okay? But who knows, maybe you can come up with some method to do so, it in the future. Well, is it that uh, it's just difficult and unwieldy, so we choose not to do it because our methods are good enough? Or is it that there's some difficulty in the math uh, that's causing it not to be done? There's some difficulty in the math that is causing it not to be done. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That's the reason, I think. But you know, all it requires is someone to come and say, look, I've figured it out how to do it with some sort of proof. And then everybody will start using it. Um, now, for most of the machine learning applications in today's world, people don't even look at Newton's method because it's too difficult. You have to compute the inverse of the second derivative. right? So they always go with gradient descent because that's very simple, or steepest descent because that's simple. Okay. So even if someone comes up with a third order method, um, which might have even better convergence properties, so more than superlinear convergence property, uh, the question would be whether it can be used for modern applications or not. And the answer in those cases would be probably no. Because of the amount of, because of the dimension of xk, uh, 
it's just too difficult to implement it on a computer and let it run for several epochs. So who knows? Okay, one of you may find it out in the course of your research. Any question? Yes. So that's a good point. Why does Newton's method get super linear whereas gradient descent does not? So first of all, this is a very, this is a coarse approximation in comparison to Newton's method, right? So you are, so you get a better direction D in which you should go. Uh, that's one reason. And what would be another reason? Okay, I think that's the only reason. Okay. <laughs> You have a much better approximation of the function around the point where you are standing, and that leads to a better convergence rate. Uh, the book has a very long proof, and I encourage you to go look at it, but I know you won't look at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So next topic is least square. So if there are any questions, I'll take them now, otherwise I'll change the topic to least squares, yeah. So are there any proofs related to the gradient descent and, and Newton's method material we've covered that are actually worthwhile in spending the time to understand? And you've mostly been saying the book is there if for some reason you never... Yes, seen. so that's a good point. So there are undergrads taking this class, there are master's students taking this class, and there are PhD students taking this class. So I cannot make the class super difficult with all the proofs so that's why we have to just work with the statements of the theorems and not go through the proofs. Uh, now, naturally, some people have adequate background in linear algebra, so you could look at the book, book and, uh, and read through the proof, uh, but that requires some level of mathematical sophistication that not everyone in the class has. I, I always encourage people who take my class to take real analysis, Math 5201 and Math 5202. Uh, but I know that uh, uh, very few people actually go ahead and take it because it's a very difficult class in maths. Okay, so now what we are going to do in the subsequent lectures is look at special cases of gradient descent and Newton's method from different angles, from different perspectives, from different problem formulations. So one of the first formulation is least square problem. I have gi function from Rn to R, i equals 1 to m. I have g as G1 all the way up to GM, and I want to minimize Fx, X in Rn, where Fx is defined as 1 over 2 norm of Gx square. This is the 2 norm of Gx square, which is also given by summation of gi square x. Okay, so what would a steepest descent for this is going to look like? So this is my, my function is given by this expression, like all these expressions are equivalent. Uh, so the steepest descent my dk would be minus gradient of fxk. 
So can someone tell me what the gradient of f at xk is? What should this be equal to? Okay, look at this expression. Okay, so what's the, so derivative of the sum is sum of the derivative, so I can take the sum outside, so i equals 1 to m. Now I have to differentiate gi square x, okay? So what would be the derivative of gi square x? Yes, so there is half outside and then I have two times gi of x, gradient of gi of x. Okay, so remember gi of x is a scalar. gi of x is a scalar. Okay, so this is scalar multiplied by a vector, right? And then there is a two outside, because two in the front because uh, this is, you can think of it as gi of x multiplied by gi of x. And once you will differentiate this, keeping this constant and the other time, you will keep this as constant and you will differentiate this, okay? So you get a two sign here. And this two gets canceled with this two. And what you have is summation gi of x gradient gi of x with the negative sign in the front. And this is the same as minus gradient g of x, there should be a k. Okay, so that would be the steepest descent direction. Let's think about Newton's method, okay? Any questions so far on steepest descent method for least square? Okay, so now all we need to figure out is uh, appropriate descent direction because we know we could choose alpha k according to many criteria, right? We have five or six rules. So the last line where we have uh, uh, negative uh, derivative of uh, G. Yes. Yes, are both those G's vectors? Okay, so this G is a matrix in N cross M, and this is a vector M cross one. Okay. Okay, so you have a matrix times a vector. Okay, and when you multiply this, you get Rn, a vector in Rn, and since X is, X is n-dimensional, the gradient of F has to be n-dimensional. Okay, but uh, the gradient of G, I, and X, X was a scalar, you said something like that? So gradient of G, I is going to be a vector. So, okay, so what's the gradient of G? Gradient of G is gradient of G1, gradient of G2, gradient of G M, right? So each of this is a vector in vector of length n. So this is a column vector of length n, column vector of length n. You stack all of them together, it becomes a matrix. Okay. okay. And it has m columns and n rows, right? So it's an R n cross m. Okay. I know it takes a little bit of practice to understand how how functions of multiple variables which maps into Rm, so this is an Rm, uh, how does it, what's the derivative of this? So you essentially flatten this vector and then take the derivative of individual functions and that's how you define the derivative of function like these. 
So next in line is Newton's method. Okay, so now I need to take the second derivative inverse multiplied by the gradient of fx k. Okay, so dk is minus inverse gradient of fx k. So let's look at what the second derivative of fx k is. So let me write the gradient of fx k equals summation of g i gradient of g i. Okay, that's the gradient of f. This is a real number, this is in R n. So what would the second derivative be? Again, I need to apply, uh, keep one of them constant, take the derivative of the other one, and so on. So the second derivative will actually turn out to be g i, second derivative of g i plus uh, gradient of gi, gradient of gi transpose. Okay. Now this part can actually be written as gradient of G, gradient of G transpose. Okay, it's the same. That just follows from some matrix manipulation stuff, so. Oh, no, this one you cannot simplify it further, okay. right? So gradient of G is something that I've introduced here, right? So it just uh, multiply the same matrix with its transpose, mm -hmm. and that gives you, this is in R n cross n, okay? It's a positive semi-definite matrix, but it's not a positive definite matrix, okay? And unless you know for sure that gradient of G is a full rank. Now, so this will give you Newton's method, right? And now in Newton's method, you need to find the second derivative of gi in order to compute the second derivative of f and then take the inverse. So then, a new method was defined called Gauss-Newton's method. Where Gauss said, let's just eliminate this term altogether and take my descent direction dk to be minus gradient of g, gradient of g transpose inverse. This is evaluated at xk and then gradient of f at xk. Why would this be, why would this, this algorithm be close to this algorithm? When would that be the case? So when would this be 
close to the second derivative itself. Any thoughts? When the second derivative is very small, right? So essentially your function gi doesn't have a curvature or the curvature is extremely small. So you can completely ignore this term, okay? Because this is not really adding much to this particular matrix, okay? And this is known as Gauss-Newton's method. What's the benefit? I just have to compute the gradient. I don't have to compute the second derivative. But what's the benefit? I get the same, not same, but I get similar convergence guarantee as the Newton's method. Now, Newton's method has super linear convergence guarantee. It converges very fast. So Gauss-Newton's method also inherits that property because it is an approximation to the Newton's method, right, under the low curvature assumption. So it's an approximation to the Newton's method and therefore it inherits some of the properties of uh, Newton's method as a result. Okay, so that's Gauss-Newton's method. Now, some of you may argue that look, I never said that this is positive definite. Okay, so if this is not positive definite, then how can I so this is positive semi-definite, okay? This is positive semi-definite, but not positive definite, okay? And if it is not positive definite, I don't know whether I can invert it or not, right? Because some of the eigenvalues could be zero, and so it's, the matrix is not invertible. So what do we do? Any thoughts? No, you could do you could do a minor tweak. You could do a minor tweak to this algorithm. You can perhaps add something to this matrix to make it invertible. But you want to make it invertible while making sure that it is it becomes positive definite. So you can't just add any random matrix. Okay, so the idea so the next idea is Levenberg Marquard. algorithm where you take dk to be negative of gradient g gradient g transpose plus some delta k which is positive definite inverse gradient of fxk Okay, so we started with least square problem. Okay, we wanted to minimize sum of square of certain functions. We have steepest descent method. We have Newton's method. Okay, steepest descent is simple, converges slowly. Newton's method is much faster, converges super linearly, but requires more computation. So Gauss-Newton's method said Look, I can drop this term if gi, the curvature of gi is not too big. I'm just going to drop this curve, drop this term here. And so my dk would be some matrix inverse the gradient. And then somebody came along and said, look, this is positive semi-definite. It may not be invertible. So how do you make it invertible while making sure that this remains positive definite or this, this matrix becomes positive definite? So Levenberg, Marquardt said, Look, I'm going to add a positive definite matrix, a small positive definite matrix, in order to make sure that this whole thing, this whole term, is positive definite. Then take the inverse and then multiply it by gradient. And this will inherit some of the fast convergence properties of Newton's method. So do we have uh, a closed form for what delta k needs to be or anything? No. If you would just take uh, some 
identity matrix multiplied by some number. Then why is that anything different? Like, why did that get named after them, essentially? Because that doesn't seem to be a sufficiently large... Look, I don't know the history. Why people name algorithms? So, so why, do, why do these names appear in the papers? I, I, I have no idea. I have no insight into that. Okay. If I knew, I'll have several theorems named after me. <laughs> but that's not the case, so I don't know. Thank you, guys. I'll see you on, uh, on Friday.